Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, this talk is kind of about burritos, but kind of not. Um, so I'm just going to go straight into it. Um, so firstly, I just want to say hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. This is amazing. This room is really cool. And the conference has been fantastic. So I'm really excited to speak here. Um, and as they said, um, I'm Joe. And I work at a company called Braintree. And we're owned by PayPal. Basically, we make it super easy to do payments. If anyone does want to do payments, you can come talk to me about that. But anyway, burritos, in particular, um, functional programming and burritos. So unfortunately, this talk isn't actually about burritos. It is about functional programming. Um, and the title is actually inspired by a very poor analogy relating monads to burritos. Um, so when I wrote this talk, I was determined that this analogy was complete tosh, and monads have nothing to do with burritos. I was kind of wrong. Monads kind of are burritos. Um, but it's fine. We'll go through that. Anyway, so what this talk is about is myths, um, functional programming myths. So this is quite a light talk. I'm not going to go into much code. I'm not going to, like, bore you with technical details. Basically, what I want to do here is kind of tackle some of the big myths surrounding functional programming, and particularly its use. Um, so why bring functional programming to a JavaScript conference? Why am I giving this to you now? Um, so I myself am a Haskeller, but I work in PayPal, which is a Node.js company. Um, and I kind of get this like instinctive reaction every time I mention anything about functional programming, where kind of everyone just looks at me like I'm some kind of like evangelical monk and I'm trying to brainwash them and they're just like, whoa, no, keep, I'm fine with what we're doing. You don't need to try and tell me what I'm doing is awful. Um, and basically, my opinion of it, and actually something I've really admired about this conference, about the speakers so far, is that functional programming isn't like some all-purpose solution where you have to rip out all your current tool set, change your language, change what, like, change everything you're doing. It's just kind of a suite of cool techniques that makes things a lot easier. Um, and a lot of the talks at this conference haven't been like what you get at quite a few JavaScript conferences, um, which are like 40 talks of competing frameworks, which all can be irrelevant in three months. And that's kind of something I really want to get across today, that functional programming isn't some hot fad new language or some hot fad new framework. It's just a suite of techniques that you can actually use in JavaScript straight away um, if you just kind of give it a go. So we can't really talk about any of that before we can't talk about what FP is. Um, which actually gets us to our first myth, um, which is that FP is well-defined. Functional programming is horribly undefined. It's a set of very fuzzy terms that kind of have come together over the ages, and as people create new functional tools and they create new functional languages, they tack new ones on. So at its basic, um, functional programming is uh, higher order functions, having functions as first class values. So this basically means that you have functions that can accept functions as parameters, and they can return functions as parameters. And quite a few of you right now are probably rightly thinking, but wait a minute, doesn't that make JavaScript functional? Um, and it totally does. And is anyone here a functional JavaScript programmer? There's got to be a couple. Awesome. Cool. And yeah, JavaScript is totally functional. Um, it's kind of like an ugly list, but it does do the job. Um, but then as functional programming has come on and as we've uh, been building new things, the definition has kind of expanded from that. And that's a bit of a simplistic definition now. So for example, it's very hard to think of a functional language and not think of advanced static type systems. Um, this is mainly due to languages like Scala and uh, Haskell especially. Um, but as functional programming, which is again this topic we'll tackle later, has been very tied to the topic of programming language theory. And as program language theory is advanced, so is the definition of functional programming. So when we talk about functional programming, quite often people mean a language with a static type system that has some certain properties. And one of these properties is purity. So purity is this idea that you limit side effects, that you try to avoid parts of your program that could interact with other parts of your system. So for example, I.O. is a side effect. So functional programmers typically try to keep I.O. either out of their program entirely or limited to one place. But with both of these type systems and purity, and this goes back to the fuzziness, they're not necessarily part of everyone's FP. So they might be part of some of the modern FP programmers, for example, Scala and Haskell, but they're not part of a closureist's dialect for FP. So this kind of idea that FP is like this all-encompassing term that means some things that you should be afraid of just doesn't exist. Like FP is just some cool concepts, some cool techniques. You can apply some of them. You don't have to apply all of them. One particularly controversial one is laziness. So this is actually mainly only a Haskell thing. Um, and basically, it's messing around with the evaluation order. So for example, if you have an arithmetic expression, 2 times 5, and you plug that into something, 
Uh, in most cases, that would get evaluated straight away, and the result would be used in what you plugged it into. Um, in Haskell, that's kind of kept as it is, and that then goes through until it needs to be evaluated, like the absolute latest it could be evaluated, which does some really cool things. Like, for example, you can work with infinite lists because it doesn't have to evaluate the whole list. If I want the 1,000th element, I don't need to know the 10,000th element, so I can actually do that. Um, but then it also makes it very hard to reason about how much space you're using. So there are some parts, of it, some parts you want and some parts you don't. Um, which is absolutely fine, and particularly for JavaScripters, you get the most powerful part, which is the higher order functions. Um, so kind of the second myth um, is that FP is very new. Um, there's this kind of impression that functional programming is like the new kid at school, and everyone's kind of looking at it with like distrust, like, oh, we've been in the industry for years, you're not in the industry before, what are you doing here? Um, which, of, of course, is like complete rubbish, because Lisp was 1958, that's only a year older than Fortran. And Lisp was very heavily used in the industry. Um, especially when you consider, for example, how many hundreds of thousands of programmers must be using Emacs in the industry. And of course, Emacs is built on Lisp. Um, but it is true that it has had a somewhat recent resurgence with a much wider breadth of languages. Um, and it is starting to have an increased industrial impact. So while it may not be true that functional programming is like the new kid into the industrial school. Um, it is kind of like the, the mature student who went off for a bit, did something else, and is now coming back. And everyone's looking at him like, why is this weird old guy in my lecture? But it can still have a great deal of relevance. Um, so this is already something I've touched on, and I regretted saying it the minute I did. Um, there is this kind of tie with FP and academia. Um, this is also expressed as FP is not for industry. Um, and this is a particularly nasty belief, because a lot of people really believe it. And a lot of people not only believe it on kind of like functional programming languages themselves, but they reflect it in themselves. They think that, oh, I haven't got a PhD, I shouldn't be doing functional programming. I actually have a friend who recently tried to learn Haskell and um, struggled with a concept, and like it just completely <coughs> destroyed him. He was absolutely like, he was convinced he was an idiot and stupid and could never do it. And it was just like, if you did that about, for example, Ruby, you wouldn't have taken that so hard on yourself. Um, so it's a very kind of dangerous belief. But Haskell is very wide on Haskell. Functional programming languages, I'm just about to talk about Haskell as why. Well. Functional programming languages are very widely used in industry. So typically, the only example anyone has been able to give until quite recently is uh, banks. It's all just money, um, lots of money. Functional programming is used a lot in like standard chartered, and I was going to leave that there for a while, standard chartered and Jane Street. Um, and they've actually typically treated which functional programming language they use as a bit of a a strategic advantage. It wasn't known until quite recently, for example, that Jane Street and Standard Chartered used OCaml and Haskell. They actually kept what language they were using secret because they considered FP such a big advantage. But now you're starting to get like much more mainstream tech companies using it. For example, Facebook are big Haskell users. They recently rewrote quite a large part of their infrastructure in Haskell. Uh, they wrote Haxel. So they actually hired one of the guys who built the compiler, um, which is probably not a standard use case, but still. Um, so what Haxel does is basically, whenever they want to query some information about users, they had this custom language built in PHP. And if you can imagine writing a program language in PHP, you can see where that's going. Um, so they rewrote it in Haskell, which is very well suited for writing program languages. And it's improved a lot of in things. And they also got some published papers out of it, blah, blah, blah. Um, and another big user, which is quite a recent user, I don't think any of them are down here. But you've obviously all seen Pusher upstairs. They just had a very recent quite public transition from Node.js to Haskell, which I'm not going to be quietly smug about. Um, but again, it's like now startups in the UK, in like startup people you meet with now, you can go upstairs and talk to them, are starting to use FPYD in industry. And then my own company, um, PayPal, it does a lot of Node.js. But over in Braintree, we actually have a large part of our infrastructure uh, that's built in Clojure. So we have what we call the real-time data pipeline. Um, so basically, we have some long-term and short-term storage between transactions you want to get out immediately and ones that have been dealt with and you only touch for months. Obviously, they all need to be recalled. We have clients like Uber and Airbnb who want to get out their transactions for years, possibly. Um, and we use Clojure to move stuff between those two storage units in real time, and it deals with it very well. So you then get to the question of like, why FP <laughs> over the existing industry languages? And as I said, because the definition of FP is fuzzy, the reasons for using it are very fuzzy. So in the case of Facebook, it's because Haskell is really good at creating programming languages, and that's what they were doing. In the case of Clojure, it's because they wanted to use Kafka, but didn't want to go anywhere near Java. Um, in the case of Pusher, uh, I think they just got fed up that Node.js didn't really scale. Ask Phil, I'm sure he could tell you more. Um, but one thing 
that's kind of tied to this idea that FP is only for academics, is that FP is for mathematicians. So this is, again, everything's Haskell's fault, Haskell's fault um, because of the use of category theory words in basic patterns. So we have monads, we have functors, we have applicative, we have transformers. All these kind of like lofty terms, and the minute you Google them, what you mean is you get a scary Wikipedia article that links to like a 6,000 page textbook written by someone with seven doctorates. Um, and it puts people off. But you don't need to know category theory. Um, stay the hell away from it, it's ridiculous. Um, and as with any other pattern in any other language, um, like any other design pattern, any other way of building things like MVC, you don't necessarily need to know the academic theory that came behind it, you just need to know how it's used. Um, if you are curious and want to use category theory in your JavaScript for whatever reason, there's this library. Um, and John Bender also did a fantastic talk at JSConf in 2012 um, about category theory in JavaScript and how they were using uh, Functor in particular to speed up JavaScript, uh, jQuery. Um, it's a very interesting talk, but you don't need to know any of that. It's just a common framework for patterns. It just happens that this mathematical idea had some very simple uh, abstractions that were really useful for a lot of programming patterns, and so they used it. But for you guys, you can just ignore maths. You don't need to know the nonsense behind this stuff. It's all abstract algebra that has no effect on your everyday programming life. And when you go and Google any of these names, ignore the first like seven Wikipedia entries. So from category theory, we now get onto the meat of the talk, which is a monad is a burrito. So this came about from a very terrible analogy. So there's kind of a running joke, which once you understand monads, you have to write a tutorial on monads. Um, there's also another running joke, which is once you understand monads, you lose the ability to explain them to anyone. So hopefully the next five minutes of this talk aren't completely lost. Um, so basically it's a really bad car analogy. Um, for some reason, they just decided to do it. Um, and I was kind of looking into it, and when I first heard of it, I was like, no, that can't work. There's no way burritos are associative. Like, this, this isn't going to hold it together at all. And then it kind of did. Um, and I had already submitted this talk by that point with this title, and so I kind of face-palmed. Um, but then I realized that, like, that's not... The, the analogy holding up isn't my issue so much with this. The issue with it is that you need to explain it with a burrito analogy in the first place. So, yes, you could explain monads as a burrito, but one of the main things about monads, and this is from the first line of the Wikipedia page, and it's actually pretty simple, is that a monad is a structure that represents computations defined as a sequence of steps. So basically, it is a type with a monad, and it defines what it means to chain operations together. So basically, you've got a computation, and you want to chain it with another simpler, similar computation, and how do the values move between those two? So yes, if you want to, you can bind two monads together in a horrible human centipede-like structure. That's not natural. <laughs> so when people think of these analogies, they just confuse the learning programmer. So essentially what we're talking about, without using any strange meat wrapped in tortilla terms, is we're talking about an object that defines how to chain similar objects together. That has two operations, and one of them has a confusing name, I will warrant, return. This isn't what you think. Um, this is creating a monad from a value. So you imagine a monad just as a, a container, as a type, as an object. You give it a value, say an integer, and then you just have monad of that value. Nothing complex. So going back to the awful analogy, your type, your value, is going to be meat with cheese wrapped in a lovely torta at the uh, burrito. Um, and then the second operation, the one that does the important thing, is bind. So bind takes a monad and a function to make a monad, which I have twice for some reason, um, and it makes a new monad. Really simple. It's just you have a thing, you have a thing that makes a thing, and you use that to make two things together. Very easy. They didn't need to come up with this strange analogy, and if any of you guys go forward from this talk and decide to look into functional programming, I can promise you you're going to meet with many strange analogies, such as spacesuits. Um, there's almost definitely a car analogy. Um, it just goes on and on. Um, but my honest advice is to just kind of deal with it as you would with any other program pattern, as you would with a map, as you would with a fold. These are all category theory ideas that haven't managed to be wrapped up in nonsense like monads have. Um, you'll also hear about the free monad laws. These can mostly be ignored. Again, they look very scary mathematical, but they're common sense things. They're how return should act in relation to bind. For example, if you bind something to a return, what monad you can get out of that. It's stuff that like, you'll intuitively pick up. Um, and the other one is just associativity between two binds, like nothing to worry about at all. 
Um, so we're getting towards the last five minutes now. So these last points are all kind of really short and kind of echo back into the previous points. So one of them is that FP cannot deal with the real world. So this is one that comes from the idea of purity. So obviously, if you've got purity and you're restricting side effects, you can't do a lot of things that we need to do. You can't do networking. You guys can't make web apps. And this comes down to the idea that FP cannot be imperative, that you can't modify this program state throughout the whole thing, which, of course, is complete rubbish, because functional languages are inherently imperative. You are controlling program state. And when you've got a pure language, you're controlling it to an even greater extent, because you can limit where it is, and you can more clearly show where that program state is being manipulated. Tied into this is the idea that FP is slow. Again, uh, actually this kind of comes from bad old days when Lisp actually was kind of slow um, because in some ways it worked and they actually tried to get around this by building, for example, completely custom machines. Um, you may have heard of the Lisp machine. It's a wonderful idea that you can build a computer entirely built for one programming language whose architecture is entirely built around that programming language. Um, but luckily we don't need that anymore because we have multi-core processors. We have very advanced compilers. Um, and then you don't even need to worry about which language you're using anyway because you've got JavaScript that can do a lot of this stuff. And the, one of the final ones I want to leave you with is that FP requires you to start again. Um, that's completely not true. You know JavaScript, you know a functional language, and there's a lot of tools to help you use that more so. You can develop your own patterns as you can with anything, but you can also use underscore or the slightly newer Lodash. And if you want to go a bit extreme and get into the more uh, the newer features, the type systems, the, these ideas, um, there's TypeScript, and even at the more extreme end, there's these three. Um, so these are actually kind of Haskell to JavaScript compilers. Um, they all do slightly different things. PureScript is the most relevant. Um, but Faye is super easy, and Elm does some incredible things. So Elm is kind of like Swift for the web before Swift existed. Um, in the discussion session, I'll show some people, because it's just mind-blowing what this thing can do. Um, it's functional reactive, really good for GUIs, really good for games. Um, and it dispels a lot about like kind of the ideas about how, fun how easy it is to work with very real things with functional programming. Um, so the final point I'll leave you guys with is that FP is hard. FP isn't hard at all. If you look at why, for example, people like me use Haskell, we use types because I'm dumb as hell and I have no idea how you guys manage to debug thousands of lines of code. I just want to compile and have it work. Functional programming was made to make things easier, not because we're all, not because functional programmers are super wizard doctors, but because we struggle to do what you guys do and how amazing you guys are at dealing with like everyday abstractions and uh, massive code bases and all sorts of bugs coming up in state and that sort of thing. You don't have to be any smarter to use functional programming. You can use it straight away and use it for really good effect. Um, so that's kind of uh, two minutes short, kind of my time. Um, but thank you. Um, this next picture is kind of controversial now, but I guess thank you.